Okay, and Annie, you're good to go for an introduction. Welcome, everyone. Annie Lala, your host for this really exciting program called Falling in Love and Staying in Love, Activating Your Highest Self Through Relationship. So this very elite audio video teleseries is a set of dialogues with some very unique teachers. I've personally curated these particular minds and hearts for their intelligence, their imagination, their honesty, their emotional prowess, as well as their hard-won experiential wisdom on relationships. I, I believe this, this group of experts are here to show us how to create and foster lifelong relationships that maximize freedom and minimize shame. Now, all of us in this program, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say we believe love can be your ultimate meditation. It can be a profound psychedelic experience. It can even be a portal to your highest self. And that's what we're gonna suggest is actually, is the point to, to relationships and to love itself. You see, when we fall in love, we trigger early attachment wounds in ourselves mm -hmm. and in our partner. And basically any painful emotions from our childhood that are still unprocessed show up in our adult relationships as behaviors driven by our defended self. And this is what interferes with our intimacy. In my experience, as a love coach, romantic relationships bring out our deepest wounds, our darkest shadows, and our craziest behaviors. And so then your partner, your romantic partner, becomes the most important mirror for your magnificence and for your madness. They are there to help you see past your myopias to what's actually holding you back from the unique, sacred expression of your whole integrated self. And basically what we're suggesting is that love, in particular true love, is a, a powerful crucible for transformation and to, to surrender to what love calls forward in you reveals the person you actually are underneath your defended persona. So I think when you approach romantic relationships as a path to raising your own consciousness, you begin to use it as a dojo or a zendo for your personal actualization. And that's when you actually get to create the most sacred dance possible between two human beings. And that's what this whole course is about, how to maximize the wonder, the magic, and the aliveness in that sacred dance. And I'm going to summarize for you quickly what we're going to learn in this seven-week program. You're going to learn how to express your emotions effectively and hold space for your partner to do the same. You're going to learn how to share delicate inner truths without fear or shame. You're going to be able to ask for your needs and wants in relationship and get them met. We're going to help you find a balance between individual freedom and devotion. And we're going to show you how to create a safe space for sexuality, both yours and your partner's. And finally, we're going to help you deal with fear, deal with anger, deal with distress in yourself and in your partner and teach you how to resolve conflict quickly and de-escalate fights. We're going to cover all that in the seven weeks with a variety of different teachers. But today, today we're in session one of seven, and we're going to be talking to my very good friend and a fellow ambassador for love in all its forms, Dr. Marf, Dr. Mark Gaffney. Um, let's see, how can I talk about Mark? Well, I'm going to read his bio first. Um, Mr. Mark Gaffney is holding his doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University. He is the president of the Center for Integral Wisdom, which he leads together with Ken Wilbur, John Mackey of Whole Foods, Barbara Mar Marks Hubbard, Sally Kempton, and Mark, uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith, and a host of other leading luminaries. He's a leading activist think tank dedicated to, well, this whole, um, this Integral Wisdom uh, Forum is a leading activist think tank dedicated to articulating a practical politics of love and to catalyzing a shared global framework of ethics, eros, and meaning. He is a visionary thinker, a social activist, a passionate philosopher, wisdom teacher, and author of 10 books, including the award-winning Your Unique Self and The Mastery of Love. Known for his rare combination of brilliant mind and overflowing heart, he teaches on the cutting edge of philosophy in the West, articulating a new dharma or a meta theory of meaning that is helping pave the way for the evolution of consciousness. But in my words, 
basically Mark, Mark is poetry incarnate. And he is one of the smartest men I have ever met and an extraordinary speaker and thinker. And what people say about him is that he, and I agree, he is evolving the source code of in culture about what it means to love. He's shifting not only our understanding of what love is, but what it can be. So I'm very excited to have him here sharing his ideas with us. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Annie, pleasure Hi. to be with you. Delighted. Now, Mark, this is a really big topic. We're going to be talking about love, which is our favorite thing to talk about. So I'm going to start you with a question, <coughs> a really simple question. What does I love you mean? Ah, Tell us. What a great place to start, Annie. First, first off, I just want to start by saying I love you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And I love Evan and, and all of us. So, you know, I love you. It's, it's just a great and beautiful place to begin, as, as you always do, you know, intuitively and, and, and so gracefully. You know, in some sense, I love you yeah. has become our sacred creed. You know, you know mm -hmm. a sacred creed when you're really confronted with, with ultimate issues, with life and death. So if I, I can start perhaps from a, a painful but, but beautiful place in its own particular way, when the World Trade Center in 9-11 went up in flames in that tragic day and people had, you know, seconds left to live and they called their beloveds, what did they say? They cite a Christian or Jewish or Islamic or a Buddhist or Taoist creed like we did for thousands of years. They said, I love you. When we recovered the transcripts of the calls, what most of the people were saying is, I love you, I love you. And it's our sacred creed. And so it calls us. And, and in some sense, you might say, you know, we've killed all the gods and goddesses except for Aphrodite, mm -hmm. right? the goddess Thank of love. God. You know, the god goddess of love. Yeah. So that's, that's one. And yet, at the same time, Right, I love you is also lost some of its power. Yeah. We're not quite sure what it means anymore. It said a lot. You know, it used to be, right, it's right. Like a exactly. reflex. I know. I hate I love you too at the end of a comment. Right, right. Like so on the one hand, it's our sacred creed. Yeah. On the other hand, what does that mean? Does that mean we're gonna get married? Does it mean you love the milkman? Right? Does it mean, you know, does it mean that we like each other? Does it mean we should be romantic? Does it mean we should be sexual? Does it have nothing to do with any of those? Yeah. Does it mean we're just close heart friends? Or what does I love you mean? And and love has become pallid, right? And and all the promises made about love don't quite get us there, right? Many of us have experienced emotions and experiences that people tell us are, well, that's love, yeah. and yet it doesn't take us home. And then we're a little bit shamed and embarrassed. We don't want to share that we had that experience that we think that's what people are talking about, you know, the poets and the, the writers and the great mm -hmm. traditions, but, but actually we still feel empty. We still feel mm -hmm. vacuous, right? And we still feel this kind of low grade, numb anxiety. Yeah. And we can't quite get over it. We, we can't quite share with people because we're sure we're the only people who are feeling it. Right. And, and so, so we've got these two poles. We've, like, we've kind of created a polarity together from which within which we can actually unfold today, you know, a framework to unfold this whole beautiful seven week journey. Yeah, you know, I love you, our, yeah, please, our sacred you creed. You know, love is just one of those, it's a word that's jam packed with so much confusion and meaning and intensity. Right. And you're one of my favorite thinkers on how to differentiate and parse out different ways to look at love. Yeah. In fact, you, you have different definitions of love. Right. I'd love you to take us into some of your definitions of love and, and give yeah, us some let's distinction. Do, let's do that. Let's totally do that. So we, we've got our sacred creed, I love you, and we've got, what does it mean? So let's start with a distinction. Let's make it, I, I want to kind of make a statement okay. and then work on a distinction. And this, this affects us all in the most real way in our lives. Okay. And the statement is a statement of dharma, right, of kind of just understanding that came down to me in a kind of direct transmission about four years ago. I was teaching a group of people in Holland. And it was one of those days, Annie, where, where just nothing seemed to fit together. Okay. And I'm looking at a group of people on Skype and it's like, you know, like a hundred people and I'm being very quiet at the beginning and they thought it was for reasons of great profundity and depth, but it was really because I had nothing to say, right? I, just, okay. I was just like out, I couldn't find it. And then oh. what came down was the following two sentences that, you know, you and I have talked about, you know, much since then, which is something like as follows. 
you know, we live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. We live in a world of outrageous beauty. Mm-hmm. The only response to outrageous beauty is outrageous love. And so what's the difference between outrageous love and ordinary love? And ordinary love doesn't actually have the capacity to respond to the outrageous pain of our lives. And our lives can be outrageously painful, whether it's the personal trauma that somehow marks all of us that you, you discussed in the beginning that's aroused by true love, whether it's actually the realization that only God knew 100 years ago what each of us knows about suffering today mm-hmm. because of the new virtual reality, mm-hmm. which has created a new psychocultural structure, which is unheard of in history, where we're, we're exposed to every bit of pain in the world. You know, and ordinary love doesn't respond to outrageous beauty. It just doesn't quite, right? Outrageous beauty demands something more. So let's make a distinction between our first distinction. We're going to be going through distinctions our entire conversation between okay. ordinary love and outrageous love. Right? And, and, and before we do that, just feel, just invite everybody, feel the word outrageous love in your body. Right? Before we kind of mind it, just feel it in your heart. Right? Outrageous love. I want to awaken as an outrageous lover. Right? That's, it's something more than... I love you, right? It's like there's an evoking of something powerful here and potent. What is it? So ordinary love is essentially a comfort strategy of the ego, right? Ordinary love means, you know, it's a tough world. I got wounded out there. I got to figure out how to navigate, you know, and love seems to be a pretty good strategy for security. It's a pretty good strategy to kind of, you know, keep the fear at bay. It's a pretty good strategy to kind of meet my, you know, first few needs in Maslow's hierarchy. You mm-hmm. know, so give me an example. What, what's, give me a, a, a film scene where there's ordinary love. Show me what it looks like. I mean, you know, most, you know, most love, you know, um, I was, I'm sitting at my friend Warren Farrell's house and we're, we're working on a, a new book. So we were going through magazine ads, right? And the magazine's ads are, you know, if he loves you, he'll buy you this diamond. Right. We just saw like a whole series of, you know, right, right. If he loves you. Right. Right. And it's, so that's ordinary love. Right. That's that's kind of and, and, and most love that's ordinary love believes the following three things. Like make it totally real for people. OK. okay? And, you know, Annie's job is always to make sure that kind of the, the meta mystical vision I want to unfold. Right. Connects to the world. So we'll kind of we'll play that dance together. So ordinary love, this strategy of the ego, this kind of comfort strategy. So ordinary love is based on three, there's three mistakes we make. We think A, ordinary love, this, this, this comfort strategy of the ego, the security strategy, what we think about ordinary love, right, is we think, or, we think that love in general, let me say more general, we think love in general is A, a human experience, B, it's the experience of an emotion, and C, it's the experience of a particular emotion, which is infatuation. Right? So we, when we say love, we think love is a human experience. Mm-hmm. We think it's the human experience of an emotion. It's an emotional experience. And C, we think it's a particular emotional experience, the experience you have when you're falling in love. And when you're no longer having that, you're now no longer connected to love. Now, that's ordinary love. Right? Now, that is a very narrow vision of love. And that's not going to take you home. And that's not going to respond oh. to outrageous pain. And that's not what you're going to say is, as you're jumping out of a window of the World Trade Center, oh, let me get some comfort security. That's not what you're saying. It's also not what keeps you in a relationship for the rest of your life. And, and it's definitely not lasts. what keeps you in for yeah. the rest of your life. Because if that's what you think love is, well, then, you know, trade in, trade up, trade over. Yeah. Right? You know, and why would that keep you on a rough day and it's not very comfortable? Right? Yeah. You know, it's not comfortable. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's excruciatingly painful. Yep. Yeah. So what's outrageous love? Outrageous love, you know, Tagore, that great Bengali mystic. Don't I you love, love Bengali mystics? He's awesome. You know, Tagore says, you know, Love is not mere sentiment. And when he says love, he's talking about what we're calling ordinary love. He says, love is the heart of existence itself. Mm -hmm. What he's distinguishing is between ordinary love and outrageous love, right? Right? Mere sentiment, love, which is kind of this mere human hallmark card sentiment, that's ordinary love. But outrageous love is the heart of existence itself. Or Dante, that great Christian, you know, poet, you know, love is the love that moves the sun and the stars, Right. Mm-hmm. Or Alfred North Whitehead, the process philosopher, said that the movement of evolution is the gentle movement towards God by the gentle persuasion of love. And it was on psychedelics when he said it. Right. right? I mean, <laughs> no, I love right? that. I mean, it's like the substrate of reality what is love. 
Right. And it's love is the eros that moves all of reality. And when quarks are hanging out, you know, kind of on street corners in Manhattan, and they're kind of by themselves, and you see another quark walking by, and she's kind of looking hot, you know, and the quarks say, hey, hey, babe, you know, hey, guy, or a guy says to another guy, hey, man, right, or a woman to another, however it happens, and let's hang out, let's have a single boundary fall around us, and let's get allured to each other, and let's be moved by our mutuality, our recognition, our, our movement to union and embrace, and let's form an atom, Right? And then those atoms are hanging out in the street corner and let's let's get together, right? Why does that exist? Where's that? There's an allurement in the cosmos mm -hmm. which moves reality to higher and higher levels of mutuality, recognition, union, and higher embrace. And Classic. that thing is what we call love. And it actually goes all the way up and all the way down. Mm -hmm. And love actually is the force that drives reality itself. That's outrageous love. Outrageous love is the initiating an animating eros of all of reality. Now, here's where it gets wild. When you actually realize that when you're really on the inside of the inside and you've stepped out of, you're kind of on, you know, the outrageous love is the new psychedelic, right? Ordinary love is bad aspirin, right? Right? <laughs> right? You know, outrageous love is you're, you're completely expanded and all of a sudden you realize Right, that actually the very particles of reality are love. Not love in a Hallmark card sense. Mm -hmm. Not pallid love. Right? Not that kind of I love, we don't know what it means. No, it's the very movement of reality to more and more recognition. More so and more it, union. I more love that. So it, if it's like everywhere around us all the time, it's, it's, it's the very fabric of existence, the then it should be, a right. then right. we should be able to access it. Every human in every moment has a way to access it. In fact, as you say so beautifully, Annie, and let me just say the same thing in a slightly different way, mm -hmm. the universe feels, and the universe feels love. Love's mm -hmm. not hard to find. Love's mm -hmm. impossible to avoid, mm -hmm. right? Every moment of reality, you're drenched, every single part of you is drenched in love. And we wait our whole lives for somebody to maybe perhaps say, I love you. Right. But actually, if you actually can listen with your inner ear and actually open up as love, you actually realize that in every moment, the universe is personally, intimately whispering to you, caressing you, not cosmic. It's not cosmic. It's personal and intimate and saying, Rumi, I love you. I love you, Hafiz. And I love you, Annie. Right? I love you so much, Daniel. Right? I love you so much. And it's a so personal address. So at any moment in time, any, anyone listening right now could look around their life if they had the wherewithal and the intention and could hear a million I love you's coming at them from right. a billion. The, the, the very, from what? From the sink reality. in their bathroom that was designed for them to use from. Give me some examples. Right. Well, so, so how do you how do you access it? That's a great question. Right. How do you access it? So let's say a couple things. But how do you actually access that capacity? You know, it's kind of like a dog can hear sounds, often yeah. that a human being can't hear. So it means we know that if you access different tracks of hearing, we can hear things that are available, mm -hmm. right? and human beings need to actually develop their capacity to hear. We need to cleanse, not just the lens of perception, we need to actually clarify our ability to hear. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways in, you know, and you know, one way in is to well, expand. Before, before, okay, you can answer this after, but I wanna make sure that people can recognize the outrageous I love you's in the everyday moments of their life. So like even just look back at your day today. Give me three I love you's that if you didn't have this model, you wouldn't have noticed. But now that you have this model, you can now acknowledge. And just share them with us. I'll say it like this. See, fantastic. Beautiful. So I say it like this. If I just stop for one second okay. and I drop into my reality right now, I go backwards in the day and I realize okay. that there are 75 trillion cells in my being. Mm -hmm. in this very moment right now, mm -hmm. that are unique. Mm -hmm. I have a unique cellular signature that it took 13.7 billion years of synchronicities to manifest, mm -hmm. right, out of a telerotic universe, the universe that has telos and eros, to manifest mm -hmm. this irreducible uniqueness called Gophne, or called Annie, and that actually all of these cells now are working 24-7 mm -hmm. in dazzling, 
gorgeous, <laughs> stunning, mind cacophony, blowing, unimaginable, right? Expanded elegance and precision yeah. that defies imagination. And they're all in love with each other, mm -hmm. holding me uniquely yeah. in this very moment as I talk to you. And not to realize that is actually idiocy, right? <laughs> Right. It's, too, it's not it's not like it's not it's like, oh, my God, I'm totally asleep. I mean, and that's true when you're happy, sad, depressed. That it's that what you just said is true. When I get depressed, which happens. Yeah. Right. And I get sad. I actually go back to my body, mm -hmm. which is one of the mediators. Right. Of that whisper of I love you. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, I, I, then I look outside. And I look outside and I said, I'm sitting now in um, at my friend Warren's house in Mill Valley. And I'm looking outside and I see the most stunning trees you can imagine. And they're elegant. And, and then look at this. They're green. And they're Ooh. green against a blue sky. And I just look at the aesthetic of the colors that are designed to enchant me. Yes. Right? right? Colors. We, we, we haven't figured out how colors work right in neuroscience yet. What is a color? A color appears in consciousness. And then I look to my right. And there's an orange. I have an orange right here, right? You want to pay, right? It's beautiful, right? And I look at it. It's an orange. Now, if I want, if I just needed to get nutrients, I could take a little pill. But the orange is totally sensual. The orange looks at me and invites me. And it's got fragrance. And it's got color, right? And it's got a visual. And then I can slowly peel it. And then I can put the orange and taste the juice. And I realize that all of reality is designed right to caress me right and to invite me and to affirm my infinite dignity and my irreducible gorgeousness and actually it's all designed right for my pleasure and not just my sensual pleasure but actually my pleasure gets deeper and i get to the pleasure of love affection and relationships and i get to the pleasure of of creativity and productivity and i get to the pleasure of wisdom and i get to the pleasure of of, of, of realizing my irreducible uniqueness and I get to the pleasure of participating as the evolutionary impulse, right? Those are all levels of pleasure, right? Actually, actually all of reality is designed, right, for my pleasure. It's just so It's, stunning. it's a conspiracy. It's, 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 it's breathing together. It's conspiring. But I begin with all the way, Theani, my body. That's, right? That's what embodiment means. Your body is always screaming, I love you. It's the indisputable I love you. It's the indisputable I love you in every moment. So when you get that, that love's not hard to find, it's impossible to avoid, that the universe feels and the universe feels love, and that's not a, it's not a fucking dogma yeah. that's owned by a particular religion that says we've got the cosmic vending machine that produces the result. It's actually not a dogma. It's not an idea. It's actually when you open up the eye of the heart, what Rumi called the eye of the heart, which is a capacity of perception, or what you of Lincoln called the eye of the spirit, then the same way I scientifically know the laws of physics, right? When I open up the eye of the mind, right? Or the eye of the senses, when mm -hmm. I open up the eye of the heart and the eye of the spirit, I actually have the capacity, right? To see with the eyes of love. Yeah. That's what it means to be a lover. To be a lover is to see with God's yeah. eyes. So how do we become ambassadors as, as uh, you know, as avatars of reality and nature itself? How do we become ambassadors for this? momentum that's surging all the time of, of outrageous love, eros. Well, I think that's, that's a beautiful inquiry. I mean, the first step is, is we anchor this reality in our body through practice that we're not about ordinary love. We actually okay. shift. I mean, it's, it's such, let's just, let's just stand up for it. It's such a big shift that it's a change that changes everything, which is why I think it's such a beautiful way to start this gorgeous journey. Right. The second you, most of the time, let me give you an example. Let me give a great example. Okay. We were just doing, you know, at our, our, our biannual wisdom school, we were doing a, a teaching with um, my kind of inner group of students, which we called loving your way to enlightenment. Right. Like but, but we, you know, we started just kind of in the opening circle, you know, it's, it's an inner circle of people who've been with me for like last five, six years, great people. So we just went around the circle and people said, okay, you know, let's talk about love. You know, what's your intention for this weekend? Right? And these are people who are awesome. And they've been with me for five years, right? Okay. And almost everyone around the circle talked about something that had to do with their life. I want to shift this in my life. I want to shift that in my life. And after everyone finished, I said, wow, I love you guys so much. But actually, you came to the wrong seminar. I'm really sorry. 
That's just, this is not the right place for that. Okay. If you start with that as your intention, we're not going to get there. Okay. Because all those are intentions are ordinary love. Okay. Now, we can get to all those intentions. That's all can happen. But it's only going to happen if you shift and you say, I'm ready to play a larger game. Yeah. Shoot, and my shoot. larger game is I want to awaken to outrageous love. I don't want love that's just limited to my little human skin and caps lead to go. Annie trying to work it out. Mark trying to work it out to get a little comfort and security. No, no, no. Awaken as an outrageous lover. I'm an irreducibly unique expression of love intelligence. And outrageous love is moving through me. When you actually awaken to that, it's kind of like, and I don't know if you've ever, you've ever been, Annie, on a, on a psychedelic journey. I mean, why would I know anything like that? But, you know, if you had been, you would say, wow. Right. Of course, that's outrageous love. Right. Everything shifts. Everything looks different. Right. There's an openness that changes everything. And all of a sudden, everything's possible. Everything can be healed. Mm -hmm. Wounds can be transformed. Mm -hmm. So as long as I'm trying to transform my wounds from this ordinary consciousness, which is ordinary love, right? ordinary consciousness, or we'll call it normal consciousness. Mm -hmm. Let me say it clearly. Normal consciousness is insane. Right. Normal consciousness has 17 million labor and sexual slaves in the world today. Hmm. Right. Normal consciousness killed 100 million people in the last century. Right. You know, who are non-combatants. I mean, that's normal. Yeah. Normal consciousness that has 17,000 children dying every single day when the world has enough to feed people four times over. Yeah. That's normal. Con normal consciousness is insane. Hmm. Right. So if you want to be enlightenment, it's sanity. And that's why you love your way to enlightenment. Right. You love your way to enlightenment because when you awaken to outrageous love, you expand Right. Your actual sense of who you are in reality, you actually feel the outrageous love, the evolutionary impulse of the cosmos moving through you. And then the fact that your mother didn't leave on the hallway light when you were a kid and shut the door a little bit more is slightly less important. It's not that you don't need to work with it. You do. Yeah. Right. But but you've shifted everything because you're awakening as an outrageous lover. And from there, love begins to have a whole new set of distinctions that completely changed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. And I want to make sure I understand um, when you distinguish these two, they're not in opposition. It seems like outrageous love subsumes and transcends, which means includes. And so it's not that we're marginalizing ordinary love. It's that, well, I mean, we all play that game. It's like, keep it and let's go bigger. No, Andy, that's why so I'm so glad you said that. That's so right. That's so awesomely important. Meaning once you awaken as an outrageous lover, then you invest all of your personal relationships, right? You invest all of your right engagements with outrageous love. In other words, ordinary love is ordinary, not because it's relational, right? But because you're trying just to work out a small thing for your own security. It's no, actually not relational. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And it's when I love Annie or I love Evan, right? Or I love Nathan or I love Kate, right? So what am I doing? I'm not asking just a small love to make me feel better. I'm actually beginning to see with God's eyes. I'm cleansing, right? The doors of perception. I'm shifting my perspective from my narrow skin encapsulated ego. And all of a sudden I'm able to actually be a lover, which means I see with reality's eyes. I see with evolutionary eyes. I see with God's eyes. Then I look at Anne and I'm saying, oh my God, oh my God. Like, oh my God, like Mirari, it's a miracle. Mirari, I behold with rapt attention and I'm in rapture and then I'm aroused to devotion. I'm aroused to devotion. And that devotion isn't at the expense of my autonomy, right? I'm not being codependent, right? No, I'm actually devoted and my devotion makes me more free, not less free. With this ring, I set you free. Did you ever hear that someplace? Yeah, right? At my wedding. <laughs> I think it was at your wedding, right? Right. Right. And as all of a sudden, my radical devotion frees me because I'm actually seeing with God's eyes. And so that's really so important what you said. So what we do is we leave ordinary love behind. We don't leave relationships behind. We leave ordinary love, which makes relationship an egoic strategy behind. And then we come back and say, wow, when Annie and Mark love each other, it's God meeting God. So this is the namaste. Right. Right. So let's make a few distinctions. So let's, let's make it real for people, okay? I mean, Annie, you're just so abstract. Let's make it real. <laughs> yeah, bring it down. <laughs> let's I mean, totally tease. Right? Let's well, make yeah, it real. Okay? Yeah, show us how to do outrageous love. Yeah. Yeah, so let's make, just, let's make a bunch of distinctions. Like, how do we do this? So, or how can we tell the difference, 
Okay, so here's here's one. Okay, here's one. Did you ever write love poetry, like to a to a beloved, like a little kind of oh, yeah. like? You know, oh yeah. Like, I courted yeah, my husband yeah. with poetry. Right. It's like oh my god. Right. And it's like like it's like now there's this moment when you're writing love poetry, and it doesn't matter whether it kind of you know is, is it like perfectly rhymed or the symmetry. It's like but you're like in. You're like yeah. in and you're acting and you're, and you're speaking with holy exaggeration, which is just beginning to approximate accuracy, right? Yeah, it's a sacred enterprise. Right, it's the sake, and you're entering all of a sudden, you're not doing this kind of horrific new age human potential cop out, which is let me send somebody a Rumi poem. Let me send someone that a dead Persian poet wrote 800 years ago, and I'll send this to tell you what I think about you. That's nice, that's good. <laughs> no, no, I'll do Hafiz, right? No, fucker, you're Rumi. <laughs> You're Uffies, right? <laughs> Rumi and Uffies lives in you. Yeah. So the first practice to actually access the experience, and I think there's actually three great practices in the world. Mm -hmm. There's meditation, there's prayer, and there's a third practice, which I actually derived from the mystical tradition and unpacked from an esoteric set of texts about 25 years ago. And it's a practice which I call writing outrageous love letters. Mm. And that's different than love letters. I was actually at dinner with a gorgeous man who I love so much named John Gray last night. Wrote that book on Venus and Mars, which mm -hmm. kind of had so much impact. So John has a love letter technique, but that's something else. It's beautiful, but that's kind of a therapeutic. It's, it's not what we're talking about here. I want to make that distinction. That's a, John's got a beautiful chapter 11, Venus and Mars. I think it's, by the way, uh, and uh, it's a great book. I think John did a fantastic job. Whether you know, We're now working on a book called Beyond Venus and Mars. He's fantastic, but that's not what it is. It's not that. An outrageous love letter is, I'm going to give you an example. I've been writing for the last, um, and I'm sure she'd give me permission to mention it, for the last, I don't know, four or five weeks, I'm writing outrageous love letters with my new total beloved, a woman named Barbara Marks Hubbard. Right? <laughs> and Barbara Marks Hubbard is awesome, yeah. and we're outrageous lovers. And we're doing, you know, Barbara calls it super sex, S-U-P-R-A. Supra, right? beyond. <laughs> a, a kind of kind of joining of genius, right? A kind of like, you know, merging in this kind of vocational arousal, mm. right? Because we're kind of kind of playing in the world and we just finished filming it, right? But so we're writing outrageous love letters to each other. Now, when we write outrageous love letters to each other, I don't write, you know, dear Barbara, it was so nice to meet you. You have just such a lovely mind and I hope we'll be able to meet again soon. And I write, dear Barbara, I'm kissing the heart of your belly. Right. And waiting, right, to feel right, the undulating rhythm of your ecstatic excitement fluttering right in my heart. Right? You know, and, and we just write outrageous love letters. And you guys have a platonic dynamic. This is like right. no, mind right. heart it's dancing with nothing, mind heart. Right. That's right. It's got nothing to do with that. And we we've kind of we've exiled outrageous love right to ordinary sex. Right. Right. I don't even want to say the sex. The sex is beautiful. We've exiled to ordinary sex. Right. You know, to right. And it's got nothing to do with. I mean, sexuality is beautiful and gorgeous. And you and I did a whole course on it. But that's not our topic here. This has got nothing to do with sexuality. This has to do with eros. This is the erotic impulse of the cosmos. And we write each other outrageous love letters. And we've actually opened between us this stunning space. You know, and, and we've kind of committed. And so one of my practices is, and Barbara's practices, is we're starting, we're writing outrageous love letters to a lot of people. I spend X amount of my day writing outrageous love letters, right, to men, women, you know, and occasionally small mammals, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. You know, to everyone, because it's a practice to what you do is, that's what Rumi was doing. Uh. Right? That's what, Rumi was an outrageous lover. The reason Rumi moves us is not because he meditated well and realized no self. I don't think so, Right. Right. The reason not, not, not that meditating is not meditating is great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need meditation. We need prayer. Those are each key practices. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't want to build our practice by saying the other one's wrong. The other one's beautiful. Meditation is gorgeous. And they actually entail each other. There's a way yeah, in which exactly. outrageous love letter is a prayer and a meditation. It's a holy trinity. As Rumi said, let me lift you like a prayer to the sky. Right. You know, and, you know, I know I wish that I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's like, oh my God, right? So, so what, when you write an outrageous love letter, you're accessing, you're doing exactly what Rumi did. Rumi became an outrageous love letter by writing outrageous love poetry. And when you access that voice in you, right? That evolutionary outrageous lover, you actually awaken that energy of outrageous love in you. And if you actually have a practice of every day, 
if you remember, I don't know if you remember back in the, um, I don't know, it was like 2000 or something like that. Um, Martin Scorsese's wife, Julia Cameron, wrote a book called The Artist's Way. Yeah. Right. And she remembers she had, Julia did a great job. And she remembers she had in that book something called Morning Pages. Yep. Right. So we're actually now finishing this work on Outrageous Love. And what we're actually inviting, there must be a couple hundred people doing it in our immediate circle now. Okay. You get up in the morning and you write an outrageous love letter. You can write it to yourself. Okay. You can write it to, you know, a place. You can write it to reality. You can write it to a friend. You can write it to a partner. To an idea. You can write it to an idea. But it's got to be fucking outrageous. Right? Meaning stretch. And if you really stretch, you might actually get accurate. Right? And and you begin to see with God's eyes. Right? It takes it takes like an audacity. It's a it's a holy audacity. It's a sacred. And when I say God, you know, the God you don't believe in doesn't exist. We're not talking about the small God, right? Who's kind of ethnocentric, homophobic, you know, and your mother chased you into the bathroom and said, you you locked the door and not to let her in. She was pounding out there with the paddle. And your mother said, God's going to get you in there. Not that God. Right. That's not the God I'm talking about. Right. We're talking about, right. The evolutionary impulse that knows your name and loves you madly. Right. So, so when you write an outrageous love letter, you're actually awakening in yourself outrageous love. You expand and you begin to love your way to enlightenment. Like, wow. Tell me more. I love that. So, because a lot of what this program is about is actualization, development, moving towards enlightenment, using love as a path. How do you, okay, so you, so you love your way to enlightenment. Tell me more about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. What is enlightenment anyway? You get it. Hello. 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 So let, let's just give one definition of enlightenment because enlightenment is often when I'm sharing with our inner circle or, you know, I'm talking to myself, you know, I'll kind of say, myself, what is enlightenment? Or I'll ask, you know, our gang, what does enlightenment mean? Someone will say, you know, oneness or, you know, um, ecstasy or, you know, kind or whatever it is. And those are all beautiful. Those are all beautiful and good. But enlightenment is only one thing. Enlightenment is sanity. That's what enlightenment is. Enlightenment is sanity. And sanity means to know your true nature. So if I say, you know, and I'll just use a man we both know, you know, my name's Evan. You say, oh, that's funny. Ha ha ha. You're saying my husband's name. No, 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 really. It's actually, I'm not Mark. I'm actually Evan. So if I say this for like another three minutes and then you kind of look for a second, you say, oh my God. Right. You know, he thinks he's Evan. You say, oh my God, the guy's crazy. Mm-hmm. He's insane. He doesn't know his identity. Right. So insanity is not to know who you are. Now, the difference between Mark and Evan is, you know, you know, fairly significant. I mean, you know, we're a slightly different age. He's a little better looking, but basically two guys, you know, approximately. Right. So that's that's a that's a minor insanity. But to actually believe that all I am is a skin encapsulated ego that's separate from other and separate from nature and separate from source. Right. And alienated from everything and kind of needing to brutally struggle. And it's a it's a a win lose world and it's a zero sum game to believe that and not realize that I'm actually true self. And the total number of true selves in the world is one. And true self is the singular that has no plural. And I'm part of the seamless code of the universe and that I'm complete indivisible from all that is that awakens and lives in me as me and through me. And it's all pulsating in me in this moment, not to know that as an actual lived reality of my life. That's fucking insane. (sighs) So we're all insane. That's insane. That's why (laughs) normal consciousness is insane. Right. What we call normal consciousness is the belief that I'm a skin encapsulated ego, which is why it's okay for me to be eating. Right. But you're not, you know, four blocks up, you know, in upper Manhattan. But that's okay because I'm eating. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you're in radical pain and you can't afford to pay your rent. But but I'm okay in my penthouse. So I'm okay, Right. You know, 70,000 children are dying today. That's okay. Well, I mean, I'm I'm okay, Right. Oh, I'm I'm a little upset about it for a second. But then I. Right. So now how how we respond to that pain is a different question, which I hope we'll get to because there's a way to respond to that. It's there's a way to get out of the overwhelm and make that real. Right. So let, let me bracket that for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but what we're talking about here is is this actual enlightenment is sanity. Now, so enlightenment means you actually enlarge your identity. Enlightenment is the transformation of identity. So if I asked you now, right, is Annie Lala's identity exist independently of a little girl, right, named Love Being? Right? My daughter. Your daughter. 
do you have an identity that's indie? And is, is, is there a possibility of any existing and like love thing is just out there someplace? It's yeah. just part of your identity. Yeah. She's totally part of your identity. Yeah. Right. Why? Because you love her. Mm-hmm. And you love her outrageously. Mm-hmm. It's not just that there's an egoic thing that love being is now kind of filled in a, a brokenness in my being. And now I've got a, a baby. That's not what's happening. I've seen you look at her. Right. You love her with the outrageous love of reality that's uniquely filtered through any lawlessness. Right, that's embracing love being and love being experienced to herself, right? Being held by reality itself. Mm. You know, when you hold a baby with ordinary love, the baby keeps kind of fussing and crying. Yeah. Yeah. But when you actually pick up a baby with outrageous love, right? She just rests in your arm because she knows she's home. Yeah. You know, you know, have you ever held hands? When you hold hands with ordinary love, and at some point it gets kind of a little clammy. You're not sure what your hand's doing there, but it's kind of okay. Right. Right. You hold hands with outrageous love. Reality stops. Yeah. Reality stops. Right, just like that. Well, take yeah. us back to the baby for a second, because a lot of people, you know, they they want to be in a state of outrageous love, but they find themselves not. The baby's fussy in their hands. or The person's not feeling connected when they touch them. What could they do? What can one do to to ground themselves in outrageous love when they're, you know, what's a practice for us? Beautiful. So I, the first practice is, is writing outrageous love letters for five minutes a day. That's okay, got it. practice. So that's another, just like people used to do morning pages. Okay. And you don't need to write a love letter, by the way. Let me give you like a little prescription. Write a love okay. note. Okay. Don't get carried away. You right? can text it's it. You text it, right? I have like on my computer right now, I'll just kind of open up my, my, my little uh, cell phone, you know, and right now I just saw it actually right before we started. Right, a friend of mine who's the senior corporate vice president of one of America's largest corporations, super serious guy, and just wrote, Mark, on your right shoulder, kissing your shoulder. Love, whatever his name is. So you've got all these love letters coming in and going out, and that's your pulsing meditative right, prayer right. practice. All through my day, right, we've got outrageous love notes kind of coming in and coming out. And now you don't have to spend your day, but pick, just spend every day, just spend five minutes accessing outrageous love and writing an outrageous love note. It literally will change your life. So start there. That's just one. Got it. it I can see how it would help you fall in love with your life. And, and, and outrageous. When you when you actually awaken to outrageous love, I mean, Annie, you're so beautiful. Or you just say, that's when you fall in love with your life. Yeah. And that's when someone can fall in love with you, by the way. Once you fall in love with your life, then you're being lived as love. And then you attract to yourself, right? You're a quark that allures to yourself another quark and you form a new atom, you form a new structure because actually you're attracting, right, in the deepest, most profound sense through the allurement of energy, which is outrageous love itself. Outrageous love always evokes allurement, not through some kind of, you know, you know, cosmic vending machine law of attraction, right? It's actually the allurement of the cosmos itself. It's the way the cosmos works. Allurement is how it works. So that's one. One is write an outrageous love note. You know, two is actually drop in to radical thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to the cells in your body. Thank you to the orange beside you. Thank you to the trees outside. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, right. And as you drop in, and if you just drop in, I would, the place I would start the second practice, let's make real practices. The second practice to the practice that we alluded to before, drop into your body and become aware of 75 trillion cells uniquely, uniquely, unlike any other, pulsating your body in this moment, and then picture imagine right the unique elegance of the cosmic interpenetrated dance and the amount of secretions and neurotransmitters that are that are that are they're that pulsing off of other neurotransmitters they're sending other you've got a million miles of nerve cable in your body and then you've got the whole lymphatic system and and then if you put your immune system and mine annies together on a screen they actually look completely different and it, when you realize that all that so this is not just evolution blindly moving evolution actually moves uniquely to form you right in other words there's this mistake out there that evolution is random actually there's no that one of the structures of of evolution is a process of random mutations that move the telos of the universe forward and if you missed that sentence just press delete on it but basically the universe is moving forward telerotically the universe has intention Right. Universe is going somewhere 
And how do you know that? The universe is intelligent. Right? This has got nothing to do with creationism. It's got nothing to do with religion. You just wake up and you realize, right, at the very moment of the Big Bang, all the laws of physics are all in play. So the universe is radically intelligent. Mm -hmm. So the universe is intelligent, right, then it's moving somewhere. Not through an external puppeteer God right. Right, who's deciding everything that makes us irrelevant. No, mm -hmm. right? we're part of the telos of the universe. And that's what it means to waken from your unconscious uniqueness to your conscious uniqueness, from mm -hmm. unconscious evolution to conscious evolution. But evolution is driven by love, evolutionary love. It's what drives the whole process. And when you wake up and you become conscious, right, then it begins to drive you. But our, let's get back to practice. The practice is go into your body and realize the unique dance of elegant symmetry and brilliance beyond anything you can vaguely imagine happening in this moment in your body, supporting your life. Mm. I'm just thinking about this for a second, Andy. If, if I send you, I can't send you a diamond, that's Evan's job. But if I send you, I don't know, you know, some fantastic present, yeah. right? And I send it to you like every day for a month. Mm -hmm. right? And I called Evan and said, you know, you know, I'm, you know, Andy's kind of collaborator. What do you think as her collaborator and kind of, you know, co-writer? What should I send her? And he said, send her this. And so I send it to you every day for a month. So if I send it to you every day for a month and I take the time and it, you know, costs a couple hundred bucks each time and you realize, I'm, and I'm, you're only going to love me more a month later. Yeah. Well, it's just true, right? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm right. But that's like nothing compared to the gifts that you're actually receiving literally in every moment right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so to be asleep to that yeah. means you're actually, it's like the goddess is giving you gifts and you're slapping her in the face and saying, fuck off, I'm not interested. So every unacknowledged I love you is, is like slapping a... Slapping the goddess in the God. face. Right. right? And I, love how, I, you know, I love how you had to get the Jewish guilt in there. I, it's good, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Listen, you know, you know, you know, we try and be appropriately enlightened and neurotic because neurotic is kind of like erotic with like a new, new. That's how that's how we work it. Okay, we're working on it. You know, me, neurotic, Freud, Trotsky, got it. We're all doing the same thing. So it's a, uh, it's good, right? So now, what's another practice? What's another practice? So another practice is. So what does an outrageous lover do? Right. So an outrageous lover. First, we should say, by the way, an outrageous lover keeps every boundary that should be kept. That's important to say. Yeah. And of course, breaks every boundary that should be broken. Right. right? But what does an outrageous lover do? Yeah. So an outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. That's a big sentence. An outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. Because what happens is you awaken and you're able for the first time to answer the question of who are you? Who are you? You are an irreducibly unique expression. You know the whole sentence. We could say it together. You're an irreducibly unique expression of what? Stay with me. Of the love intelligence and the love beauty that is the initiating and animating energy eros of all that is. That lives in you, as you, and through you. That never was, is, or will be ever again other than through you. And through this, right, through this unique love intelligence, you have a unique insight that fosters your unique gift that awakens your capacity to address a unique need in your unique circle of intimacy and influence that can be addressed by you and you alone, which means there's a corner of the world that is unloved, that unless you awaken as an outrageous lover, right, God can't reach that corner of the world. That corner of the world's unloved. And so what do you need to do into that corner of the world? You need to commit your outrageous act of love. So you think you've got a problem, a crisis of meaning, why do I exist? It's over. It's over. And here's the deal. Mark Goffney can never do Annie Lala's outrageous acts of love. Can't do them. So we are a collection of outrageous acts of love that can be only done by us. Your outrageous act of love is a function of your unique self. And your unique self is this irreducibly unique expression of the love, intelligence, love, beauty that lives uniquely in you, as you, and through you. So when we come together, you and I get to love each other. Evan and I get to love each other. Right. Because I can never do Evan. I can never do Annie. And you're not going to do Mark. Right. It's just not going to happen. So once I get that, I can be in devotion to you. I can say, oh, my God, it's right. Like Annie is committing these outrageous acts of love that are part of this larger, unique self symphony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a symphony. 
cacophony of outrageous love. And here's the thing. And, you know, I was talking to our friend, um, one of our friends this summer, who's got a very, very, I would kind of, kind of a pessimistic, you know, environmental disaster worldview, right? <laughs> you know, you know that. I get that. And there are finite resources on the planet and there are real issues, but you know what? There's an infinite resource. And that infinite resource is the realization that we can actually unleash a politics of outrageous love. And if you're actually Ooh, a genuine evolution. A politics of outrageous love, which is not a top-down world where some government or corporation or organization does it for us, but it's what, you know, there's a movie out a few weeks ago um, called, uh, what was called The Imitation Game, right? It was about my hero called Alan Turing, who really, in an essay called Morphogenesis, developed the notion of a self-organizing universe, mm -hmm. that the universe has inherent ceaseless creativity, as Stuart Kaufman called it, which self-organizes towards higher and higher levels of mutuality, caring, love, and embrace. So how does the universe self-organize? What causes the self-organizing force in the universe? The answer is you awaken as a unique self. Your uniqueness, just like an ant in an anthill, knows exactly what to do unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So human beings, if they self-organize, create this wave of outrageous love that's committing outrageous acts of love, coming together collaboratively in unique self-symphonies, which are now politically being called peer-to-peer -peer networks, peer-to-peer -peer progressive networks. What that means is we come together in the Kickstarter this year, right? Funding art projects has a $200 million budget. The National Endowment of the Arts has a $157 million budget. What happened? So what happened is with the beginning of this wave of outrageous love, where actually I'm acting in the world, I'm committing outrageous acts of love. And when we come together, we become a community of outrageous lovers. We create a self-organizing universe where we can actually direct our energy and attention through our own shared vocational arousal, each committing a unique outrageous act of love that overlap with each other. We each have a different commitment to ending world hunger, but we each have something that no one else has. We each have a puzzle piece that completes the story. And those don't need to be, any starting an organization. They don't even need to be starting a soup kitchen. In your circle of intimacy and influence, there are outrageous acts of love that you can perform. And that's the third practice. The third practice is commit outrageous acts of love. They can be private. They can mm. be healing some lineage in your family that's mm. never been healed. Right? They can be, you know, right, making a commitment that you're going to always ask the name of every waiter and waitress for the next two weeks because no one's an anonymous it serving you. And by asking a name, you're opening up a space that actually ripples through the world, just mm -hmm. like the butterfly effect does in physics. Mm -hmm. So we have three practices. Practice one, it's a holy trinity. Practice one, writing outrageous love notes. Practice two, radical attitude of gratitude. Radical thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I have a practice, which I'll just share for a second without, right, is it when I finish making love, I say thank you, right? Right? I say thank you. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's right? to reality, including you, as part of it. Right. To, to you and to me and to, and to really thank you. Right? So reality is making love to me in every moment. Yeah. Right? I'm being fucked open to God in every moment. And, and reality is asking me to fuck reality open to God. Right? right? Kabbalists call that zivug. Right? It's the holy, right, you know, eros. God is eros. Right? And I say fuck not in its kind of, it's gotten exiled to a degraded sense. I mean, fuck in its high sense, the way the capitalists use it, right? That you're loving reality open. You're loving the moment open, right? So, so in every moment, you're loving the moment open. The moment's loving you open. So say thank you. 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 And then finally, right, I commit outrageous acts of love. And I actually commit, I'm, I, I awaken as an outrageous lover committing outrageous acts of love. And I'm holding that intention. I'm not doing a good deed. I'm not giving charity. Got it. Right? it takes courage to do outrageous acts of love. They're not easy. You're like defining your existential imperative in that moment. It takes courage, and it's the only thing that fills us. Right. That's how you know you're doing it. Outrageous act of love, right? You don't say to yourself, it's kind of like, you know, outrageous acts of love is the best sex of your life. Right? Right? When you're having the best sex of your life, you don't say, hmm, I wonder what the meaning of existence is. You know, I think I need some Prozac. I'm feeling a little depressed now, right? You don't ask about the meaning of life because it's self-evident. Yeah, right, 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 right. So when our friend Barbara, my beloved, says supra-sex, right, she means the same thing that I mean when I say God is Eros. It means that when you're committing outrageous acts of love, you're loving the moment open. 
you're making love with reality, right? And, and actually, you can only do that when you realize that reality is always making love with you, right? Reality is always whispering, I love you. I love and it, so, Mark. Yeah, it's like, that's, I mean, reality, that's what reality is. I love it. This is such a perfect um, scaffolding and structure on which to hang the rest of our sessions yeah. where we talk about romantic relationships. And I love that you just talked about love at large. You in love with reality, reality in love with you. And the thing is, when you find your partner, they are a piece of reality as you are. And so all these practices work with reality can just be mapped over to the people you love in your life. Yeah. Because they're, I mean, they're pieces of reality. So beautiful. Annie. And we have to democratize outrageous love. Yeah. It's not just roomies anymore. Yeah. It used to be a, the great shamans, the saints, the poets. Right? the great poets, right? Those were the outrageous lovers. Right. And we're just ordinary people doing our little ordinary love. Right. You know, you know, William, you know, Willem Reich wrote a book. What was it called? Um, Listen, Little Man. Mm. And Listen, Little Man was another book he wrote called The Murder of Christ. And it was basically about, you know, how, you know, we're small people and we need to kill the people who are large because they're the Christ. And we want to kill the we don't want to kill Christ. We want to become Christ. Remember that we are. And we already are. Already, yeah. We already are. And actually, outrageous love lives in us, and it lives in us uniquely. And there's outrageous acts of love that are ours to commit. And when we commit them, it's not that we're showing up and making a difference. Fuck that. When you commit them, you're living an extraordinary life. You know, and my, my favorite kind of teaching is, you know, don't ask what the world needs. Don't be so pious. Right? Ask what makes you alive. Yes. The world, the world needs you to be alive. Yes, I love that, Mark. And you, well, something you always say that I just want to close with. Um, you, you say that we are an outrageous love letter that the universe is writing to itself. Yeah, amen. And thank you so much, Mark. Um, I, I'm sure we have lots of questions. We've got a Q&A opening up right now, and we've got a lovely woman named Ashley who's going to curate the questions for us. So I'm going to open up. Now, I'm just going to let you know the questions. We, we brought it. I mean, Mark brought it in this talk. So bring it in the questions, whatever you want to ask, we'll answer. So let's hear from the first person. Okay. Well, hi, can everybody see me and hear me? Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I know folks are still typing their questions in, in the chat box. Um, but I, I have a question. So, so I'm just, I'm just imagining, um, you know, this idea of Aphrodite and, and kind of keeping her, her alive. Um, you know, how, how can we do this in a work setting? Because I mean, I, would your boss necessarily, like, how could you do this in a way? How can you bring Aphrodite into the workplace? Let me ask, let me ask it that way. Right. right without getting sued. Right. Without, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. See what happens. I mean, actually, I love that inquiry. Right. Thank you so much. See, for us, it's hard to imagine Aphrodite and outrageous love without bringing it into romantic love, yeah. right? And so we can't conflated. Out, right? What would Aphrodite be doing in the workplace because she's romantic love? But actually outrageous love, you outrageously love your sister. You outrageously love the tree outside. You outrageously love your work. Right? You know that the single biggest problem, I'm sure you do, right, in work in America today, the average worker in America right, works about 40% of the time, right? 60% of work hours are spent chatting and being unmotivated, right? Because people work with ordinary love, right? Meaning work is a strategy of the ego. I need a job. I got to show up. I got to make a living. But what would happen if you actually brought outrageous love to your work? If you actually said, I want to experience the pleasure of productivity and creativity, no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to show up and be an outrageous lover. So I'll give you an example. Chick-fil-A is the name of a big, like kind of a good version of Kentucky Fried Chicken in the South, <laughs> right? And Chick-fil-A is one of the most successful franchises in the country. And when you look at their training videos, essentially what they teach their salespeople, but not in a kind of Tinsel way, but in an authentic way, right? They say, be outrageous lovers. They don't use that language, but they say every single person who walks into Chick-fil-A has a story. And every single person who walks into Chick-fil-A has had their heart broken. 
And every single person who walks into Chick-fil-A, right, is a unique expression of reality. And again, these aren't their words exactly, but that's exactly it's what they're saying. And so receive them not as a person who's buying a piece of chicken. Mm. Receive them completely, right? Let them feel like, like welcome. And what happens is literally in the South, you can ask tons of people, people, kids say, let's go to Chick-fil-A. Because there's something happening in Chick-fil-A that's just, that's just happening. You can just feel it, right? You can just feel it. Now, Chick-fil-A happens to be owned by fundamentalist Christians. So they're coming from a kind of fundamentalist kind of Christ loves you place, which is beautiful. I'm all about Christ loves you. I like that much better than a liberal, tepid, no love in the world or just ordinary love. But we need to liberate outrageous love from a Christ consciousness only because it's also Buddha loves you. And it's also reality loves you, and it's also evolution loves you, and it's also the Shakti loves you. But if you actually build, like, you walk into Chick Fil A, they're selling chicken for God's sakes, right? Right. But actually, you actually feel that you're being received, and you're being held. I'll give you one one other example: psychology, right? Se- second example: Ashley. You know, you remember that dude in the mid '70s who wrote that great book? Um, you know, uh, Scott Peck, right? <laughs> Completely interesting man. Right. So Scott Peck writes something kind of shocking, you know, in his book, The Road Less Traveled, which was that classic book, which I think deserves to be a classic. I think he did a great job. But he basically writes that all psychological method essentially amounts to a hill of beans. Right. The healing process of psychology is when you love your client. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that you sleep with your client, yeah. although parentheses, <laughs> just parentheses. Right. Scott Peck wrote in his book. That if he thought sleeping with his client would be therapeutically effective, he would. Which was the best selling book in the 70s. Today, if you even said that out loud, you'd be shot That's in amazing. front of a firing squad. Right. So the 70s was a kind of different era. But let's bracket. I happen to think that, you know, Peck was wrong. I think that sexuality has no place today in a therapeutic relationship, but love does. Unless you're married to your therapist. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Love does. Right. And that's actually powerful. Psychology doesn't work through psychology works through love. You know, I'll give you the last example. Right. Um, a very close friend of mine who's a partner in the Center for Noble Wisdom think tank is a guy named John Mackey, who's a grocer. And he runs a, a bunch of grocery shops called Whole Foods. And he started 360 of them around the country. And John always says to me, it runs Whole Foods is love. Right. And he doesn't mean it in an abstract way. It means that every person on every team in Whole Foods is empowered. And they engage every person who walks in and they're in love with food and they're in love with kind of changing the culture of eating in America. And when I went and I, this is before I met John, I went to write my last book, Unique Self. I was living in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I couldn't figure out where to write it. And I decided to write it in Whole Foods at the restaurant because I felt good there. Huh. Right. Because there was something happening there. Yeah. And Whole Foods has been successful. Right. Ultimately. Right. Because it's driven by this love that suffuses the system. And love's not weak, love is strong. It's the strongest force there is. I love that. Yeah, love Ashley. Us. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Yeah, the one thing I'd add to you, Ashley, is like in a very sort of subtle, granular way, is every time you interact with someone at work, feel in your body the softness in the space. The yeah. softness from them to you. They, there was a conversation, you weren't included, they included you. Um, there was a clarification that had you feel more understood. These are little microscopic I love you's in disguise and it's your job to uncover them and they're happening between every human being in every interaction and definitely at work and it's our job to just kind of scope them out. They're hidden. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Ashley. So we have a we have a question. Um, what what do you do if your partner is not open to receiving outrageous love? Yeah. So what you do is really simple. You don't talk about it. You just do it. <laughs> you don't say, hey, hey, babe. You go first. But hey, you know, if you actually begin to love them outrageously, which means, and this is what they are willing to receive, it means you're willing to stay open when otherwise you might have closed, right? It means that you're willing to do work that you never would have been willing to do based on ordinary love, which is a contractual exchange. And did I get enough and am I giving enough? Right. So one of the demarcating characteristics or one of the ways to identify the litmus test of outrageous love and ordinary love, right, which is critical for a relationship, is what the capitalists call the secret of the kiss. What's the secret of the kiss? 
right? Usually in life, you're either giving or you're receiving. Either putting money in your bank or you're taking money out of your bank. And if you, you take money out of your bank and you tell the teller to credit your account, you get thrown out of the bank, right? But actually in love, that's undermined. Love is subversive, right? Love holds out a vision of a different reality. So in a kiss, which is the symbol of love in Kabbalah, right? The giver and receiver are one. There's no quite giver, there's no quite receiver, right? They collapse, right, into this larger, so usually in a relationship, we're keeping score. But there's a way to stop keeping score in a relationship, not where you get abused, not where you get taken advantage of, that's not what we're talking about, but you actually begin, right, to step up and keep your heart open in every situation. And for a man, for example, that might be, you know, your partner comes back after a long day, and, and let's, let's do it. Let's, I'll give a heterosexual example, although I could, give, I could give a homosexual or a lesbian example, but I'll give a, a classical heterosexual example. Let's say your partner comes back and, you know, she just wants to talk about her day and you just don't want to talk about your day, you know, and you don't want to hear her talking about her day because it's going to be driving you out of your mind. And it's taking a long time. She's going to but it's the same thing that happened yesterday. Right. And see, and she's got a problem at work. She's told you try and solve it for her and she gets mad at you. So you actually you say, well, you know what? I'm an outrageous lover. And I actually realized that my partner, right, gets something from me listening to her. So I'm going to love her so much that I'm going to just kind of deeply listen. I'm not going to try and solve the problem. I'm just going to be here and listen. And that my goal is, my masculine goal is to listen. And all of a sudden I'm producing testosterone because I'm listening. She's getting lots of oxytocin, right, because she's talking, right? And I'm not figuring out, right, a scorecard or a calculus, right? I'm just completely receiving, fulfilling my goal, right, of making her feel better. And I was willing to do the work to figure it out because I'm an outrageous lover. Yeah, I was right? willing so, to do the work, like internally, whatever it took to breathe through the discomfort. That's and right. not just to listen, but to listen so that she feels heard. Right. There has to be sign off on the FedEx delivery. If she doesn't feel heard and you're busy saying you listened, then it didn't get delivered. That's ordinary love, not outrageous love. Right. If I actually access the quality of outrageous love, then I am. Let me just try and say it clearly. I am the human being in reality that was manifested over 13.7 billion years in this moment. Right. To give this person an experience of their irreducible gorgeousness and beauty and dignity. Right now, that's not like I got to listen in order to make her feel OK. That's like I am outrageous love incarnate, the evolutionary impulse in this moment. I am the only person who can address this unique need, and I am delighted to do it. And I'm filled with testosterone by doing it because I'm actually accomplished something that no one else in the world could accomplish but me. I'm an outrageous lover. And, you know, it wow. sounds – I want to add to the question that the person who's claiming that their love's not getting received, the outrageous love, I would be in an inquiry about where um, you don't – Feel in yourself your own sense of outrageous love for your aliveness and start there. Um, it, until you embody outrageous love for yourself and for reality at large, the other person can't hear your utterances from that direction. So you got to start being congruent. Otherwise, you're incongruent. You're speaking outrageous love, but you're not outrageous love yourself. That's fantastic, Annie. And I remember in our course, um, Sex Without Shame, um, we talked about this idea that people have like a love ceiling. They're, they're only, they're only able to, right? That's right. They're only able to love it. They're only able to accept so much love. Beyond right? which it feels scary and terrifying. Right. And I think you pointed out really beautifully that I remember, right, that often that comes from the environment in which you grew up, in which there was a kind of a level of love that was acceptable. But beyond that, it was inappropriate. So that's the place where you start becoming an outrageous lover, right? Break you, to the ceiling. Right, exactly. You're able to break the glass ceiling. And so when your lover says, that's too much for me, that's not because they don't want it from you. It's that they're kind of stuck and you've got to actually help them liberate themselves and to actually heal whatever needs to be healed. So I'm actually able to receive that full measure of pleasure and that full measure of love. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Like that. What <laughs> any more you know, we actually, I think, I mean, t this is such a rich conversation. I think people are probably just <laughs> soaking it in. So we don't have any questions at the moment, but I'd love maybe if you could go in a little more to that idea of um, 
sex and shame. You kind of touched on that a little bit. I don't know if we have time to go into it fully, but, um, you know, maybe touching into into sort of the, the sexual side of, of this dynamic outrageous love. Yeah, I, I have a way to get into there, Mark. And I want to ask you, because you're such a master at talking about pleasure. And you just talked about just now, you know, pleasure, pleasure limits. How how does pleasure relate to outrageous love? And then maybe relate that to sex. But but outrageous love and pleasure have a very intimate dynamic and that you've mapped out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I mean, what's is there an inherent pleasure when you occupy the acts of outrageous love that you're talking about. Right. When we talk about sexuality, let's just try and clarify for a second, which would be really just fantastic. What is sexuality? Sexuality is the evolutionary impulse of the cosmos that awakens in you. Why is sexuality so powerful? Why does it sometimes sweep us away? Mm -hmm. Right. It sweeps us away because it actually is the evolutionary force. It's not this little small thing happening in me. But it actually is, right, the new narrative that Ann and I talked about in our course, Sex Without Shame, was the narrative of not sex negative, not sex positive, not sex neutral, not even the old sex sacred, which says sex is sacred because it creates life. Although those are all are true but partial, obviously, right? But actually, for most of us, when we're having sex, right, we're actually not creating life. And so people say, well, but it has the potential to create life. But that's not what most of sexuality is about today. We actually need a new narrative of sacred sexuality. And the new narrative of sacred sexuality is an evolutionary narrative. It's the realization that the evolutionary eros is pulsing in you. Right? The evolutionary eros is awakening you as sexuality. And so that when you actually realize that, then you realize that that's outrageous love. That actually sexuality itself, mm. and in order to heal the shame, you need to realize this is not some pathological drive. It may sometimes express itself in broken ways, it may need to be healed, but the core drive is a drive to make contact. It's a drive for mutuality. It's a drive for embrace. It's a drive for union. And just notice that's the drive of Eros. That's the drive of outrageous love. So actually, there's no such thing as a split between sex and love, right? Right, right. Sex is love in the body. Yeah. Now, okay. you can have unconscious sex, right? In other words, you can have, now, so someone says, so what about a rapist? So a rapist, right, is, is complete unconscious and is not expressing love, right? A rapist is actually, right, unable to access love, right? And so then using, right, sex in its, in its, in its tragic, sad form, right? Of course that's true, right? But, 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 it's, but sex, when it's kind of classical, healthy sex is always love in the body, which is why, right, right, when it's not that way, it's such a violation, Right. Yeah. You know, I always say I said to our friend, we had a conversation, I think, Annie, at um, last summer that you and Evan were doing it with our friend Alex. Right. Where I said to Alex, there's no such thing as casual sex. Mm. Right. right. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you marry the person you have sex with. It doesn't mean there's not vital sexing. It means it's never casual. Right. Sex is always contact. It's always sacred contact. Sex is always right. Outrageous love expressed through your body. And the more conscious I become to it, the more awake I become to it, the more I can have a sacred moment. And it could be that a couple meets for a night and mm -hmm. they never see each other again. Mm -hmm. But it's radically sacred because I actually realize we're coming together in this moment. We're honoring each other. We're bowing. Right? We're pleasuring each other. We're recognizing each other. And we're not supposed to live together. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to buy a U-Haul, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's not the nature of this relationship. But it's utterly sacred. So what sex is, is, is outrageous love in the body. That's actually what it is. That's and that's why it's so powerful. That's why it's so potent, right? When, when, that's why we're kind of embarrassed by sex. That's why we turn sex into a curse. Fuck you. It, that's also why sex is so painful. Right. And um, heartbreaking for some. When, when the gap is missing, the, the love in the body and the sex is happening, whether it's a one night stand or a couple that's been together for 20 years, but close off and fantasize about someone else when they're together. And I'm not making those wrong. I'm just saying there's a, there's a heartbreak that's palpable in the space when they're divorced. Yeah. You know, we actually got a big slew of questions 
here. So I know it's, you've gotten everyone thinking. So uh, we've got one question from Sasha. Um, there are times when people may feel in the gutter and swampy uh, parts of their lives. It can be difficult in that space to find the resources to access outrageous love and gratitude. How can one pop themselves out of that state when it initially feels fake? Hey, see, Annie, take it away. Yeah. Um, so Mark alluded this, to this earlier. Usually when you're in the swamp and you're a dark, depressive, life is fucked state, what's happening is you're looping in your cognitive mind. You are not in your body. And whether you're connected to the millions of trillions of cells doing magic to create your aliveness or not, just going to your breath and going into your body and doing a, a, a stretch or an exercise or a walk or Pilates, any kind of movement that takes you out of the cognitive loop, you know, depression, um, swampiness, darkness, that to me, that's code for my brain is looping on a narrative that is disempowering. If you're able to take a magnifying glass and go into that person's brain, they're looping on something. And you need a pattern interrupt to the loop. And the fastest pattern interrupt to any kind of mental loop is to find a way into your body. And everybody can find their own way. They have their special trap doors. For me, it's, it's literally, and this is my favorite simple portable tool, it's three to five deep breaths where the exhale is twice as long as the inhale. If I can... Get, find my wit and wherewithal to take my place, to take myself into three deep breaths with the exhale twice as long as the inhale, three to five breaths. I begin to move out of here and into the soma. And in the soma, there's something true that I've forgotten. I'm alive. I'm alive. And I'm alive is always an empowering place to start from. And you forget that when you're up here because you're in some catastrophizing doomsday scenario anyway. So, finding your way to your breath, finding your way to your body, any way that you can find your way into your body. That would be the first thing I do. And from there, you could, you know, visualize what Mark said about your trillions of cells, but just getting into your body reminds you you're alive. And I think um, depression comes from feeling dead. You've forgotten your life. Right. Mark, you have anything to add of practice? Yeah, I, think that's, I think that's completely beautiful. And I think that Really what you're saying, Annie, but you're, you're giving a very specific and very, very helpful right, way of enacting it. Right? The way you work depression is always to insert a wedge of awareness. Right? And breathing, you know, the Hebrew word for breath is neshama, soul. Right? So breath and soul, we conspire, we're inspired. Mm -hmm. breath, is, breath is magical. Right? It's utterly and totally magical. And I think that's just a, a beautiful, beautiful way in. And let's just say one last thing, which really complements what Annie said so, so beautifully. You know, the ideology of depression is always futility. Mm -hmm. right? And again, you know, we're not talking about, you know, there's two kinds of depression, of course. There's momentary depression and there's chronic depression. So momentary depression and chronic depression you deal with differently. But with both of them, what you do is you've got to find that actually your life matters. And your life matters. And that's where you always go to unique self, right? And that's when you drop into your uniqueness, you realize you're not extra on the set. Mm -hmm. You actually realize, right? And, and imagine the feeling, I'll just give you a simple experience to do it. Imagine just as a quick, this is like a one second cash practice. You got a phone call from the president. The president said, is this Annie? Yeah, this is Annie. I've been tracking you. I know you were born Trinidad. I know your family, but I've been tracking particularly what you're doing, your ideas. I've read your blogs. And actually, we need you, right? The country needs you. There's something in your presence and your transmission that's desperately needed by all of reality. And you realize he knows you, knows everything about you. Annie, are you with me? And he says, oh, my God. Like, oh, my God, Evan, Barack Obama just called. You're sure it's him. When you get off the phone, are you depressed? I don't think so. <laughs> You're not depressed because you just had the realization that you were needed by all of reality, right? So that's what breaks unique self. Depression mm. is replaceability, mm. right? And the realization of unique self is that actually anniness is desperately needed. So I think actually what Annie and I were just talking about was a first step and a second step. I think mm. Annie's description was actually the critical first step. You can't even go there. Right? You first have to, they, but they call it in psychology, you have to stabilization. You gotta regulation. Stabilize. You got to regulate your nervous system out of the Right. Terror. You got to regulate and soothe. Gotta, that's step one. I then described after any step one, step two, which is I think what you alluded to, then you go the next step, which is an identity. 
you do stabilization, and then you recall your identity. You remember who you are. But I wouldn't, don't try to remember who you are before you did any step. First step is stabilize. Second step, remember, right? Because hope's a memory of the future. It's a memory of oh. your future. Yeah, and oh. Sasha, even if you don't remember, um, you can call someone who does. Ah. I guarantee you, your community remembers and can reflect back to you your unique magic when you forget. And that's, again, the importance of having a circle. Beautiful. Very nice. Now, there's a number of people who have questions about um, boundaries. So um, just to kind of bring these questions together, um, you know, one person asks, how do you share outrageous love without expectation? Another one asks, um, how do you create boundaries in case uh, if you are being an outrageous lover, but you get apathy or neglect in return, how do you know when enough is enough and when outrageous loving is costing too much? Um, how do we know the difference of when people are receiving outrageous love and when they're not and when to step away? So what do you guys think? I love, I love these questions. I'm, I'm so, I'm to first off, thank you to every person. And, and this is the cluster of questions that I was waiting for it. It usually takes, whenever we have this discussion, it takes like, people are kind of like shell shocked, like what's that? And then think about it. And then usually some version of this set of questions comes back because they're really great questions from really great people, obviously. So here's the deal, okay? And I'm gonna be kind of super, you know, kind of super straight, direct, totally loving, quivering tenderness, but clear, right? Those questions are based on the premises of ordinary love, okay? Right? And it's all of those questions in one way or the other are basically saying, right, well, if I'm not getting enough in return, am I giving too much, what's my boundary, right? Clearly you should navigate all those issues, but you awaken as an outrageous lover because that's who you are. Right? And outrageous love is not a strategy. Right? And outrageous love is who you are. Now, so just being that version of yourself. That's who you are. Right? And that's not like, in other words, and as all the questions came back with the classical strategic questions, how does this work? What's the boundary? I'm giving too much. Right? And those are all great questions. They all need to be addressed. They're all honorable questions. But actually, this is the point of outrageous love. You're an outrageous lover because that's your identity. That's who you are. You are an outrageous lover. Now, you may decide as an outrageous lover, you may decide that you want to, you know, show up and take your beloved on a surprise vacation, or you might not want to because you think that that's not the right thing to do at this moment in the relationship because whatever the reason is, it's not about, it's about who you're showing up as in your life. Who are you? You're now, you're a unique expression of the outrageous love intelligence, and that might not be expressed vis-a-vis -vis your partner. Good morning, Vietnam, right? Our love lists are too short. Right. We, we keep you know, just notice we've got to get out. Of, and I might be expressing my outrageous acts of love at work. I might be expressing it in my vocation. I might be expressing it in my art. I might be expressing it in my circle of friendship. I might be writing an outrageous love note right to a 97 year old man. I might be kind of adopted. Right. There's a th right. And so we kind of we take all of our love and just notice all the questions which were all important. And Annie's going to jump in and address them in a second. Right. But be before any kind of is like lovingly addresses them. I want to I want to lovingly bust us all a little bit. OK. Right. In other words, what we kind of do is we say, OK, no, it's not about romantic love, but really it is. It's about me and my partner. Now, yes, you need to make this work between your partner. Yes, this has to have efficacy in your life. But the way it has efficacy is you transform your identity. You actually you make something new happen right in your life. And what happens is when you awaken as an outrageous lover, meaning you actually say, I'm not strategizing. I'm actually I'm actually write an outrageous love note every day. I can write it to myself. I can write it to reality. Access that quality in me, and I guarantee you, one billion percent, your relationship will shift. You'll discern more, right? Yeah. Something will open in your partner, yeah. right? right? But it'll happen. But you've got to first become the person who allures and invites love in by awakening as an outrageous lover. Yeah, I want to just phrase, rephrase it. Please. Being an outrageous lover is finding the ancient primordial ground of your being and living as that aliveness, the only way it can be lived when you're honest and integrity and congruent with your indisputable uniqueness. When you are that, when you are being that, there's not a matter of boundary crossing or not boundary crossing. You, you are just, you're moving through reality as magnificence. 
and a piece of magnificence, aware of its magnificence, not in a vain, you know, self-absorbed way, but just like, I am in love with this moment. When you're in love with your moment, nobody doesn't want to be around you. Nobody feels like you're trespassing their boundaries. Nobody yeah. feels like, oh, it's a, he's too in love with his moment. I mean, unless you're doing it in a false, grandiose, theatrical, right. fake way, right. right? But when someone's in love with their moment, like a frog, like a two-year-old, and you catch them in love with their moment, your heart melts every time. And, 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 and Andy, that's so, and here's what happens. So we have it as children, and then we appropriately, let me be clear, we lose it as we kind of move into our separate selves and establish our, right, you know, kind of separate self boundaries and we should do that mm -hmm. right? a healthy ego is healthy ego boundaries but then we then ascend a, a third level of consciousness where we reclaim the innocence of the child at a higher level you know and i i'll give you a word for that i call that post tragic mm -hmm. right right so there's the pre-tragic i'm kind of a child two years old doing my thing i'm a frog right <laughs> you know, I'm tragic i kind of wake into a separate self and a, jagged painful reality that i live in then i go post-tragic right. you know? meaning you know and yates has that beautiful poem he says when such as i cast out remorse right i can dance and i can sing right we're blessed by everything and everything we look upon is blessed right right when i cast out remorse meaning i get beyond the ordinary love strategy right you can dance and you can sing you're blessed by everything and everything you look upon is blessed and you create in your wake a circle of blessing mm -hmm. right and better than any you can you can t you can you can implement every strategy of relationship but if you don't transform your identity if you don't expand your heart the strategies aren't going to work now you can also expand your heart and not have good strategies you need both you need sacred technologies but sacred technologies only work when you've actually engaged in enlightenment, which is a transformation of identity, right? It's sanity. It's actually knowing who you are. And as long as you're living in your smallness, as you're living in denial, whenever you live in denial, right, you're internally destroyed. And it's only by owning, right, your infinite gorgeousness, right, not as a narcissist, but as the natural expression of who you are, that you begin to realize that your uniqueness doesn't separate you, it connects you to everything. Yeah. Uniqueness is the currency of connection, not yeah. the property of alienation. So beautiful questions, mm -hmm. and, and we got to really practice. We're talking about literally an evolution of consciousness. We want to transform the very source. And he said in the beginning, and I appreciated it, you know, this idea of kind of trying to evolve the source code of reality and of love. And actually, it's what, it's what makes me get up in the morning. But to evolve the source code of love means it's not a surface shift on the desktop. We're in the source code and we're changing something essential about how we actually understand love. And we actually, and it's not easy, but we can do it. We can do, we can actually create new neural pathways. Love's not just my personal strategy. It's not just how I get Laszlo, you know, Maslow's you know, first four needs, right? It's not just comfort love. I want the radical pleasure of the evolutionary eros awakening in me. Mm. It's a self-evident desire. And if you want to access it, not 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 to go do this. Here's the last sentence. You don't have to do anything. But just think about sex. Sex is always the great teacher, right? Why do you want great sex? Just because, right? Because it makes you feel alive. Because you're that's what that's what outrageous love is. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Annie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Annie, so much. Annie, you're you hold such gracious and gorgeous space. It's just a delightful moment to be with you always. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ashley, for the questions. Thank My you, pleasure. Ashley. Yes. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, that's the end of session today. And uh, we'll be talking with another master in the next session. So stay, stay tuned. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Mark. Great session tonight. Let's have a, cute, a few uh, closing uh, remarks, if folks would like to just stick around. Um, so just a quick note, we do have an Evolver Learning Lab Facebook group. 
So if you'd like to stay in touch and just continue the conversation between the classes, you're more than welcome to join. I've left it in the in the uh, chat box, but we'll also be emailing that to all of our uh, attendees tonight. Um, the session recording will be uh, available tomorrow, and it will be an MP4 and MP3, so you can listen on your phones, take it with you. Um, and if you have any questions about that, just send me an email. So um, just a quick note, we have a upcoming uh, Evolver talk, which is a two-part, special two-part month of love talk. And that's happening um, on February 19th. And I'm leaving a link to that in the chat box as well. And um, actually, we have another one, a uh, month of love talk for uh, libido and natural aphrodisiacs with um, Adonito Flores. So I'm also leaving that there. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we really appreciate it. Oh, yes. Um, one more thing. If you're going to find our email, uh, if you can't find it, check your promotions box if you use Gmail because it, it often pops up in there with MailChimp. Anyway, thank you so much and uh, have a great night, Annie. Take care, Good Mark. Good night. Good night, Mark. Good night.